Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, first, I want to start by acknowledging that we're here on occupied Chumash land. And when they lived here, they uh, had a pretty nice place and our culture has managed to trash it really, really fast. So the journey tonight, we're going to not spend too much time, but go over the problems of fossil fuels uh, briefly to kind of ground us all. It's mostly stuff we already know, but it's good to be reminded of just how serious the problem is because all too often the media and even when people talk about the current issues, uh, they aren't very comprehensive about it, don't, don't really portray the full scale of it. Uh, then we'll move on to some of the false solutions that are offered up by governments and corporations and even mainstream environmental groups. And then we'll move on to real solutions. Uh, then a little bit about what comes after the future we can look forward to post, post fossil fuel. And finally, what you can do, how you can get involved. And as I talk about the problems of fossil fuels, I'm going to be focusing mostly on the impacts on humans. Uh, but it's worth keeping in mind that all of these effects are even worse for non-humans. So fossil fuels from extraction all the way to combustion are destructive. Uh, so starting with extraction, there are tens of thousands of well sites in Colorado alone, and they fragment the forest and the land base that's there and uh, fragment habitat for all of the wildlife who would live there. Uh, here we have two different scenes. On the left is mountaintop, the result of mountaintop remining in uh, mining in Appalachia in West Virginia and that region and there they blow off the tops of the mountains and fill and poison the streams and the valleys in between. Then on the right side, and we'll come back to this a little bit more later, is the Niger Delta in Nigeria which is a major oil producing region and the water, air and soil are all heavily contaminated there. So. Right now, more than five and a half million humans get killed each year uh, due to pollution directly from fossil fuels. And that includes air pollution, soil pollution, work hazards and exposure and chemicals. Um, and it's been rising steadily since 1990. Uh, obviously, deforestation is a problem. And as with many of the things I'll be covering, fossil fuels are a major accelerant. Some of this was going on even before fossil fuels, but the machinery and the access to global markets and the capitalist incentive have skyrocketed the rates dramatically. So right now we've lost 80% uh, of global forest cover. And every year about 16 million acres of natural forest are cut. And that is an acre every two seconds, which is kind of unimaginable. It's difficult for us to conceive of that scale. Then industrial agriculture is basically biotic cleansing on a massive scale. Uh, just entire landscapes mowed down and turned into human sustenance and in the process uh, removing all the topsoil and, and anyone who is living there. Uh, factory farms, we mostly, most of us know how horrendous those are for the animals stuck in them. Uh, agriculture in many places leads to a massive runoff which winds up uh, the excess fertilizer winds up in the rivers and the oceans causes algae blooms and c kills fish directly. Industrial fishing is both emptying the oceans and uh, disproportionately impacting subsistence fishermen, uh, fisher people. Um, so, yeah. Uh, from 1950 to 2003, the oceans lost 90% of the big fish. Uh, and there are lots of statistics like that that are kind of unimaginable. Um, most of us weren't around in 1950 to have it as a baseline, so we're kind of imagining, but 90% decline is obviously huge. Industrial mining is. Uh, responsible for, again, almost unimaginable large-scale destruction. So this is kind of a pretty picture, uh, but it's actually pretty horrendous. Uh, this is the Bayan Obo rare earth metal mine in China, and rare earths are needed for electronics such as solar panels, cell phones. Uh, 
And to give you a sense of the scale here, this is roughly six miles wide by four miles high. Um, this tailings pond, this is where lots of the poisonous uh, chemicals that are used in the mining process and leaching out the, the minerals. This is where they wind up, so it's an incredibly toxic pond. And this is about one and a half miles long, one third of a mile uh, wide, so about 320 acres. And obviously this massive scale destruction is only possible with fossil fuels. And then the big one that we all know about is climate change. And uh, often we see the bathtub model of water, which stands in for carbon, is pouring in way faster than it can drain out. And we'll come back to this model soon. Uh, Climate change is often portrayed as something to worry about for the future, but it's already having big impacts right now. So estimates are that almost 22 million humans per year are displaced from climate and weather related disasters. So that's not all purely climate change, but definitely climate change is exacerbating, uh, causing more frequent and higher intensity disasters of all kinds. So uh, that's already been increased. Uh, the number of refugees, and the estimates are about 400,000 human deaths per year. That was in 2012, and that's projected to get up to about 700,000 by 2030. Um, so that's increasing. And the projections are between 250, billion, uh, 250 million to 1 billion climate refugees, so specifically people displaced by climate disasters by 2050. Uh, so over a two month period, actually I think this was one month that happened to straddle two, two calendar months. Um, in one month, 50 million humans worldwide were affected by floods, uh, which basically means one in every 150 humans. Uh, so very, very high. So India got hit. The, uh, we know about, we probably heard about uh, some impacts in the States, Houston, Philippines and Florida. And it's actually misrepresentative of me. Um, I just showed four slides of crazy floods and it's misrepresentative of me to show two of them from the US um, because as with most of the impacts of fossil fuels, the negative effects fall most heavily on the poorest countries and on the poorest people within those countries. So actually of the 50 million people affected, 40 million of them were in India and Bangladesh. So the U.S. had only a tiny, tiny, only suffered a tiny portion of what we're disproportionately responsible for causing. And uh, we're probably pretty familiar with the impact of fire. Um, scientific study was done that estimates about 16,000 square miles in the western U.S. have burned since 84, specifically because of climate change. So that's over and above the normal frequency of fires. So obviously the Thomas fire happened here just last year. Um, yeah. Uh, climate change impact on the oceans. Uh, currently approximately 25% of coral reefs are dead with another quarter of them degraded. And it's estimated that by 2050, uh, 2050, all of the coral reefs could be wiped out and the oceans could be completely devoid of fish. And these are all kind of unimaginable, horrible things, but scientists are putting out solid research projecting this, um, but we're not really talking about it much. So this may be the most important slide of this whole presentation. Right now, uh, the planet has warmed about one degree Celsius over pre-industrial levels. Um, so what we're experiencing right now is one degree. Uh, usually when politicians and discussions of this are happening, there's talk of a two degree limit trying to keep the world below an increase of two degrees. Um, but that number has been chosen kind of arbitrarily, more for political reasons than scientific reasons. Um, a lot of scientists think that one degree is probably as dangerous as we want to get. And as my statistics earlier showed, we're already seeing, I mean, this is a value judgment of just how bad you think is okay for things to get. So 400,000 humans per year dying from climate change and all the ecological effects. Um, a lot of people 
think that this is already way too far. But that set aside, the politicians are talking about two degrees, scientists often talk about two degrees as maybe the threshold where we'd wind up with really catastrophic climate change, whatever that means, as if this isn't enough catastrophe. Uh, positive feedback loops may very well increase the warming. So things like the, the ice sheets melting means less reflectivity to bounce sunlight back and the oceans will instead absorb more heat so things will warm up faster. Uh, increased drought and fires means more trees get burned, which means they release carbon directly and then they aren't able to absorb carbon uh, and play their part in the carbon cycle. And then the other piece that's very little talked about, but multiple solid scientific studies uh, do have projections on this, is that it looks like at least an additional 0.5 degrees of warming would happen basically within a week if we stopped burning fossil fuels tomorrow. That's because besides the carbon that's put up when fossil fuels are burnt, also particulates, particularly especially uh, sulfates, I believe, wind up in the atmosphere and act as tiny mirrors up in the atmosphere. So the sun hits them and a certain amount of it bounces back into the atmosphere. So to revisit the bathtub model, this would be more accurate if the tub were completely full uh, because we don't have any room left to burn more carbon. And if there were a pretty strong rainfall happening to represent all of the positive feedback loop of the portion that isn't even under our control, like we could turn off the water at the tap, but there's rainfall coming in from outside that we can't stop anyway. And then all of that adds up to mass extinction. So currently one in three species are threatened with extinction. The extinction rate is about 1000 times the normal background rate. So humans are causing this massive spike. And so not only is this morally reprehensible and heartbreakingly tragic, but it's also a problem for human survival. So that's the problem. Uh, the solutions that are sold to us by pretty much everyone from corporations, governments, mainstream environmentalists have a very limited toolkit that they allow in response to these crises and the answers they allow us to consider really are not commensurate with the scale of the problem. So we'll go over those briefly, um, including governments taking action to save us, uh, grassroots voluntary mass change to shift to a sustainable way of living, green technology and energy efficiency. So governments, most of us probably have zero confidence in them anyway, but it's worth Looking at the timeline uh, since 1975, when global warming was first being theorized as a problem and pretty quickly confirmed by scientists as being something to watch out for and the precautionary principle would suggest that with the entire planet at stake that you cut scale back a bit. Um, and then there've been a whole series of agreements, conferences, uh, Kyoto is the most well known and Throughout all of this, our carbon emissions have risen constantly and the carbon concentration in the atmosphere has risen consistently. Um, and so the, the latest hope from the governments is the Paris Agreements and they're targeting that arbitrary two degree target. Um, it looks very unlikely that governments will take enough action to even hit that and they're going to way overshoot that. And part of the evidence for that is that there's pretty much no scaling back in all the industrial projects that are in the works. So there's still tens of thousands of miles of pipelines under construction or planned for construction. Uh, companies are still building new natural gas power plants and coal plants, which we know are pretty much the worst for uh, triggering climate change. Coal plants globally uh, enough of them are being planned globally to increase coal burning capacity by 43%. So not only are the actions on the ground not uh, reducing emissions, but they're still proceeding ahead at full speed. Um, this is a similar chart and what's notable here is that the only year in which 
we reduced emissions was after the big financial crash of 2008-2009. So we've never reduced emissions voluntarily, uh, only when we've been forced to do so. And then this is another longer term look at carbon uh, concentrations in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide concentrations. And you can see here that we're on a something of a uh, exponential curve. If we had just kept going at the rate we were in the 60s, we would only be here, but instead it's continually, the curve is ticked up. So green technology, uh, solar panels, wind, other alternative energies are often suggested as a solution and they can be useful in their place. But what's important to note here is that these alternative energies have been under development for 25 years and in recent years they've been installed at unprecedented rates. Uh, but the overall demand for energy has risen far, far faster, and so that's all been filled by fossil fuels. And what is really important to note here is that as solar panels and wind have been installed, they haven't caused uh, fossil fuel plants to shut down. Instead, they just added to the total energy supply available. So they're definitely not a solution to the problems we're facing. Energy efficiency is similarly touted as a kind of win-win situation where if we can just use energy better, then we'll supposedly use less of it in the future. And so this is a look at total uh, carbon emissions from fossil fuels from 1900 to present. And we know that lots of advancements and lots of efficiency improvements and better ways of more efficiently burning energy were introduced over the time. And instead of people saying, okay, well, I can do what I wanted to do using less energy, rather they thought, oh, I can do this cheaper, which means I can do more of it and use these technologies now to go exploit other areas of the earth and dig up more fossil fuels from even deeper and just keep everything growing exponentially. So energy efficiency is definitely, will be helpful for the crash uh, when less energy period is available to people. It'll be great for us to learn how to use what we've got more efficiently, but it's done an answer to actually scaling back. So this might be the most difficult point to accept because it's literally sold to us the most aggressively of all the solutions. And that's the idea that individualism, individual personal consumer choices are the way out. And this kind of relates back to the idea that masses of people will voluntarily decide to consume less, et cetera. Um, we'll come back a little later to how living simply can fit into activism, but personal purity in and of itself doesn't do anything. I mean, that's kind of what I learned by moving to Hawaii and living very simply off the grid, obtaining most of my food from the land. Um, but we need to ask ourselves, do those benefiting from the status quo prefer us to buy greener products uh, or even buy nothing at all. Um, they're not really afraid of that versus our taking action to actually shut down the flows of fossil fuels. And so that's why this false solution is sold to us so aggressively. Okay, on to the real solutions. And basically we must physically shut off the flows ourselves. And so far, the environmental movement has been in using or following a strategy of attrition. And attrition is basically a protracted, slow struggle to wear down the opposition, where two forces just grind against each other and you try to hurt, slow down the other force enough, slowly wear them down until they give up. And so the environmental movement uh, files lawsuits, boycotts, divestment campaigns, even when it does blockades and lockdowns, it's just trying to slow down the advance of industrialism. Um, so that by military strategists is not considered a very good strategy, even when you're equally matched. And it's completely unsuitable in an asymmetric conflict, which is definitely what we have. Um, you can't see it in the picture, but there is one tree sitter in one of the trees, and there are a couple of people signing petitions under one of the other trees. But even so, our side is vastly outnumbered and outgunned by the industrial forces 
on the other side. Um, to begin winning in a war of attrition, we would need not only to stop all the new expansions of infrastructure and fossil fuel that they have planned, but we'd also need to be closing down the existing infrastructure. We obviously need to scale back the destruction and the fossil fuel carbon emissions that's already happening. But even that would be too gradual. Um, as I showed, we're in the midst of crisis already. Things are going to get worse. We really have no time to spend on a gradual war of attrition. So even if we had the people power for that, we don't have the time. So looking briefly at principles of strategy, which military historians and strategists have come up with, uh, Little Hart being one of the historians and strategists, um, the basic aim is to discover and pierce the Achilles heel of the opposing powers ability to make war. So in our case, pretty much everything that industrial society does to make war on the planet and also on the many, most of the humans who don't benefit from the system, um, all of that depends on fossil fuels. That's their Achilles heel. Uh, these principles are especially important in an asymmetric conflict where you really can't afford to make any mistakes. So the principles include making sure that all of your efforts are going towards clearly defined and the most important objectives. You don't want to waste energy on secondary pursuits. Uh, you want to seize the offensive, um, put them on the defensive, which is the exact opposite of what we're doing. We kind of react to new projects that are made and try to block a small fraction of those. Instead, we need to take the word to them, choose the time and place, um, and by doing so, we can apply our strength to their weakness um, because we can decide where we're going to hit them. And by using surprise, you can greatly increase the impact that your limited forces can have. Uh, by hitting multiple targets at once, you put the enemy off balance. And uh, with carefully chosen multiple targets, it can have a synergistic effect where the sum of it is greater than... Uh, the total effect is greater than the sum of the immediate impact. Unity of command is kind of a tough one. Um, in traditional militaries, the idea is that there's a general who has a good feel for the whole battlefield and can direct all the different forces in the ways that are most effective. That is really unlikely for the environmental movement to have. Um, the next best thing is that the people engaged in action have a clear understanding of the strategy and are kind of all on the same page and can at least coordinate loosely with each other. Um, security is obvious. You don't want to get caught. You don't want to let the enemy gain any unexpected advantages. And intelligence in this context means knowing as much as you can about the opposing systems that you're trying to affect and the targets that you're trying to hit. So instead of attrition, what we are advocating is a strategy of cascading systems failure. And Little Hart again says a strategist should think in terms of paralyzing, not of killing. And so in the, mostly the environmental, like obviously we're not, not talking about killing humans anyway, but in terms of industrial infrastructure, we don't need to stop it all. We just have to paralyze the system to the point where it can't function anymore. So this means thinking in terms of systems dynamics, the flows of materials, particularly energy, the nodes, which are the crucial places through which the flows have to go. So if you can block a node, then you impact multiple flows at once and bottlenecks, which are particularly the places where, uh, where you can have disproportionate impact, where everything has to come through or a lot has to come through. And so this image shows kind of huge blocks that might be difficult to push over by yourself. Uh, like if you were to tr try to just push this over, that might be difficult. But if you can start a chain reaction with smaller multiple targets initially, they can lead to cascading systems failure, whole domino effect of taking out more and more of the system. Uh, this is a chart. I won't go over the whole thing here, um, but it's attrition versus cascading systems failure. And it tries to encapsulate a lot of the principles of strategy and what that might 
look like uh, more concretely as we think about what we're doing. Um, so rather than reacting defensively to new projects that they announce, Cascade and Systems Failure Strategy would target operational infrastructure to use the elements of surprise. Uh, and the system is obviously functioning on what's there right now. They want to expand it, but it's not going to cause that much disruption if we just stop some of the expansion. Whereas if we stop the existing flows that are happening that the whole system is dependent on, then that causes a lot more disruption. So targets are chosen for that reason, for uh, their criticality to the system. The goal is to trigger a domino effect. Um, the tactics, uh, mostly the attrition tactics have been blockades and occupations um, as far as direct action goes. And that's because it's a defensive reaction to new projects that are announced. Uh, whereas with cascade and systems failure, you really want to be using hit and run tactics where you use surprise, come out of nowhere, cause damage and disappear, then do it again in another unexpected place. Uh, the goal of all this is to damage or destroy infrastructure and make as much of the operations impossible uh, as you can. Um, more skill, planning, and caution are needed for cascade and systems failure, but fewer people and fewer resources are needed. Um, so if you think, it, we'll get to this example shortly, but if you think about Standing Rock and the thousands of people involved in that uh, versus eco-saboteurs who might be able to hit a pipeline with just two of them, and we'll see examples of that shortly. Um, a key thing here that I'll also be addressing later is the difference between above ground actionists and underground actionists. Um, above ground people are doing it publicly. Uh, they're easily identified by the system. So they can easily participate in attrition uh, through civil disobedience, blockades and occupations. But if they were to like actually go out and plant a bomb in broad daylight on a pipeline, uh, the courts would not be very lenient on them. They could not get away with it and do it again. Um, whereas underground activists are completely capable of repeated attacks of that kind. Um, the underground activists can also carry out attrition attacks if they want to, so more flexibility for them. And then finally, the system response uh, for attrition just reroutes around the damage or holds off on the expansion for a little while. Whereas with the cascading systems failure, the system is disproportionately affected. So here's an example of pretty sophisticated above ground civil disobedience. Um, about two years ago, I think, in five different pipeline sites, uh, pipelines carrying tar sands from Canada to the US, five different people or even groups coordinated to all cut their way through the chain link fences to the shutoff valves for the pipelines. So they literally in broad daylight just went and cut open the lock to get into here, cut open the locks on the valves and turned the valves and shut off the flows of oil in the pipelines. And then waited around to be arrested and use that as uh, to try to get the message out. Um, so their, their practical on the ground effect is that they reduced the imports of oil to the US by about 1 million barrels. Um, which I think is approximately 8% or so of U.S. daily consumption. Um, it's a lot of barrels, like 1 million barrels is a lot of oil, but this did not trigger any domino effect um, because the refineries who, which receive the oil have stockpiles, so they're e easily able to just draw down the million barrels from the stockpile and keep refining and keep pushing gasoline and other products out to the markets. And on the production end, they also have storage tanks, so the oil backed up in the pipeline, but that just meant that they put their oil to top off the tanks a little bit more. Um, so that's one of the biggest limitations of attrition, is that you can't really leverage it. Uh, the Unistoten camp in British Columbia, Canada, is another great example of civil disobedience. And this is a very strategically chosen blockade of pipelines. 
Uh, so the train in British Columbia such that all these pipelines that were planned to get from uh, tar sands areas out to the western coast uh, for export to overseas markets, all these pipelines had to go through a bottleneck in the train um, because of all the mountainous uh, land. So the Wet'suwet'en uh, have unceded territory. They've never given it up to the Canadian government. So they have some legal status to be there and block these pipelines um, that isn't available in all places. Um, they're also supported by the fact that there's been a lot of grassroots support for them, like the fact that they have legal claim to the land doesn't normally stop governments from going in and doing what they want to do anyway, but they also have heavy grassroots support. They have year-round volunteer crews and events where lots of people come out and learn how uh, members of settler culture can and should support indigenous people. Uh, people come out, get active training and activist skills. They help patrol the land. Uh, sometimes survey crews from the pipeline companies come in by helicopter and the Unistotan have evicted the helicopters, just gone up to them and said, this is our land, you don't belong here, leave, and they did. Uh, so the end result is that with probably needing no more than like two or three dozen people on site year round, maybe not even that many, they have actively blocked multiple pipelines from being completed for eight years and counting. So a hugely disproportionate effect. So that's a great example of finding the bottleneck, finding out where you have strength and applying that. Um, so even though this is attrition, it's been very efficient and effective. So we can contrast that with Standing Rock, which is great at raising awareness. Most people who are at all tuned into this, these issues are aware of Standing Rock. Uh, so that's another civil disobedience and another kind of blockade slash protest camp. Um, the presence there ranged from the low thousands to I think as many as 10,000 people or more. And of course there was support uh, from all over, probably internationally of donations of money and supplies and so on. And their end result was that they delayed the pipeline completion by maybe two to three months. Um, so this is attrition that was somewhat effective but very inefficient using that many thousands of people for two to three month delay. Uh, so then we can contrast that to Jessica and Ruby, who are kind of my personal heroes now. Uh, they are Catholic workers from Iowa who were participating in some of the blockades against the DAPL pipeline, the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, they had some success locking down to equipment to stop the construction crews from being able to proceed for that day. And I think while they were on the lockdown, they looked at each other and said, if we can be this effective at slowing them down, what would happen if we took more direct action? And so this is what they did. They went on a spree over, I think about two months of torching a lot of the construction equipment and using, uh, I think just welding devices purchased at like Home Depot to burn holes and expose sections of the pipeline that weren't complete yet. And they just went up and down the, the line didn't didn't know how to do any of this when they started. They just learned how to create incendiary devices by looking online and applying common sense, figured out what kind of weapon equipment would be needed to cut through, what kind of steel and you know what the pipelines were made of. Uh, they believe that they delayed completion of the pipeline by several weeks. So contrast thousands of people for two to three months with two people doing it for a few weeks, delaying for weeks. And they estimate, obviously this is kind of hard to know for sure, but they estimate that with another eight people carrying out similar attacks, just hit and run attacks up and down the pipeline, that they could have stopped it for good. So that would have been an example, if it had worked, of attrition, like constantly hitting the pipeline, costing the company too much money, that maybe they eventually would have decided, we just have to give up on this. Um, we don't know if that would have happened or not, but. Uh, certainly they were very efficient. And one other 
lesson to take from this is that while they were carrying out their sabotage, the media mostly did not report on their attacks. Um, we didn't find out about it until they stepped forward to publicly claim responsibility for what had happened in hopes of inspiring other people with how easy it was and how, how it's morally necessary. Uh, so there could be a lot more of this happening out there right now, but the media just may not be reporting on it because they don't want to inspire people. So that's why I'm here. Okay, so back to the Niger Delta. I showed the slide earlier of the horribly polluted water. Um, so Nigeria uh, has had oil extraction for many decades. And as with most resource extraction, the benefits have not at all gone to the local communities. Communities, Instead, they've suffered hugely from the negative side effects. Um, so the Goni people, like there are lots of different tribes there, but the Goni, I think, are maybe the most active, or at least the most well-known. So they were consistently appealing to the authorities to address problems like oil spills, destroying their fisheries and destroying the farmland and uh, pollution literally killing them. But the region is run by oil companies and by the government, which is in their pocket. The government depends on the oil revenue. So Ken Sarawiwa and eight others, well, Ken Sarawiwa, I think, was the main leader, a poet, nonviolent activist. Uh, he and others ran this nonviolent campaign to try to drive out Shell, Shell Oil Company and the military regime. And in response, they were hung. Um, despite global outcry saying that these trials are a sham, the government just went ahead and convicted them of some bogus charges and hung them. So in response, the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta started activities in 2005. And they decided that nonviolent direct action and appeals to those in power don't get us anywhere except killed. And so they took matters into their own hands and began sabotaging oil infrastructure, carrying out guerrilla warfare against the police and the military outposts that were trying to guard the pipelines. They kidnapped foreign oil workers and held them for ransom. They had a good track record of returning them unharmed and treating them well with respect. In 2013, so there are eight years of their disruptive actions and we'll see their impact shortly. Um, in 2013, the oil companies and the government finally decided that the best thing to do would be to buy them off by promising to clean up the oil industry, bring benefits to the communities affected by the oil extraction and uh, pay a lot of money to all the fighters, like hire them as security forces if they would lay down their arms. But not too surprisingly, the government didn't follow through on all of its promises. And so 2016, a, basically a continuation of the same guerrilla strategies started up again with the Niger Delta Avengers. And besides the previous like speedboat surprise attacks on oil facilities on land, like they use speedboats to get up the many waterways and then attack installations on land. They also figured out how to attack offshore oil platforms and even underwater pipelines. And so this is really important for all environmental activists to see, assimilate, compare against what the environmental movement as a whole has achieved otherwise. So the militants in Nigeria have caused a sustained reduction in oil production in the country of 10 to 40 percent. So that's way more than any of the rest of the movement has ever managed. Um, so that means they've obviously there's some give and take, uh, but at the far left is pretty much where production was with business as usual. And then MEND, the Movement for Emancipation of Niger Delta, kicked in and really drove things down. And then here, I think, is where Niger Delta inventors sprung up. And they were especially able to use surprise because the movement had been dormant for a couple of years, so the oil companies were less on their guard. Um, and even though they've definitely killed some people, they have definitely used violence, I think not excessively or unnecessarily, but when they commit raids on defended platforms, they're 
not, they don't call off the rays just because there are people defending it. So they've taken some lives, but when you look back to the numbers I mentioned earlier of about 6 million humans per year being killed by fossil fuels right now, and you calculate how many barrels per day they've cut, they're basically saving between 500 and 1,900 lives per month. So they are working for the greater good, uh, both for themselves and for the larger global impact. So we don't have to resort to violence, but we do have to focus on critical infrastructure. We have to let go of the strategy of attrition and start to think seriously about how the stuff flows and where we can intervene with the numbers we actually have. So the physical elements include obvious things of wells, pipelines, the transportation routes, uh, refineries, power plants, and ports where they export things. Uh, the systematic infrastructure uh, behind all this includes administration, finance, uh, all the, the stock market and the funding that the companies need to expand new projects, uh, telecommunications, all the communication that all the sites depend on, and just-in-time supply chains. This isn't so obvious, but there, actually the, the single biggest dependency and vulnerability for fossil fuels is probably the electric grid. Um, pretty much from every stage, fossil fuels depend in some way on electricity. So the, the biggest coal mining drag lines and shovels, there's a drag line on the right there, which is an insanely massive machine. Those rely on electricity coming in from the grid and they even have like dedicated tractors underneath them that just manipulate the line so that this gigantic thing doesn't mess up the power line. Um, pipelines, uh, oil and gas pipelines have pumping stations and compressor stations to keep the fossil fuels flowing and often those stations are run on electricity. So if the grid goes down, then the pumping stops and the fossil fuels stagnate in the lines. Rail lines, which are also used to transport coal and oil, um, are also dependent on electricity. Uh, refineries and coal preparation plants, where they take the next steps to turn the raw materials into the products that are actually used depend on electricity. And obviously project administration just running the company these days depends on electricity. So this massive machine, uh, before it was decommissioned, when it was operational, like actually running, it drew the power of 27,500 homes. And they had to coordinate with the utility companies to make sure that the utilities were prepared for the extra load that this thing would draw when it was turned on. So, I say the electric grid is perhaps the most vulnerable. Um, there's a cool website out there called Operation Circuit Breaker, which highlights some of the vulnerabilities, specifically in the transmission lines. So there are tens or hundreds of thousands of transmission lines, high voltage transmission lines going all across the country and the world. And they're relatively easy to take out. I think the site talks about things as simple as taking bolts out of the uh, the foundations of the tower so that a good strong wind will eventually topple it over. It talks about using a rifle to shoot the lines and how easy that is to do. The guy like did some experiments with it. Um, and he, there's even a fictional scenario on there in which a coordinated attack is planned to take out some lines and some transformers at the same time uh, to shut down power on a broader scale. So that's a perfect fictional example of implementing cascading systems failure. And then a real life example uh, up from, from up near San Jose. In 2013, there was the most sophisticated attack in US history on infrastructure. Um, basically, it seems like multiple people uh, were involved and they cut the communication cables to prevent 9-11 calls from going out. So they cut the cables and then they shot transformers in the substation for 19 minutes. Um, they shot the cooling apparatus on the side of the transformers so they would leak out the cooling oil and the transformers would overheat and fry. Um, they crippled the substation for weeks 
there haven't been any arrests to date. Um, blackouts were avoided. Um, the electric system is designed so that the loss of a single major node doesn't affect the rest of it because, you know, natural disasters can hit and just equipment failures. So it is designed for that. But probably if there had been another group coordinating with them, hitting another substation at the same time in the area, then the whole region would have had a blackout for a while. Uh, so the other piece of electric systems besides facilitating the extraction and the transportation and the refining of fossil fuels is that electricity cannot be stored really. Uh, when we turn on the lights in this room, a power plant somewhere spins up very slightly to generate more electricity to send over here. So there's like a split second balancing that happens with computers and all kinds of sophisticated stuff to keep everything uh, perfectly balanced within the grid. And so what that means is that if demand to a whole area is cut off, then a lot of the fossil fuel plants or a lot of the power plants will have to spin down because there's nowhere to send their electricity. So they'll just stop burning. And the majority of electricity does come from fossil fuels. So there's a very good chance that whatever plants are shut down uh, will immediately in the moment decrease consumption of fossil fuels. So there's that direct effect. So uh, uh, borrowing another tool from the military, we have the Carver matrix, which is used specifically for target selection. And uh, basically it's criticality, how important is an element to the system, accessibility, how easy is it for us to get to it, to damage it, recoverability, how quickly can the system repair the damage that's inflicted due to this damage to this target. Vulnerability, uh, once we get to it, how easy is it to actually cause damage to it? S effect, which is kind of side effects of what might the impact be on uh, civilians in the area or if like you're attacking a pipeline, are we possibly gonna cause an oil spill that might cause ecological damage? And finally, recognizability, if you're out there in the night on a dark, rainy night, how easily can you find and recognize your target? Uh, so, so far, most of the actions in the environmental movement, like of the ELF, the Earth Liberation Front underground activists, um, definitely can't fault them at all for commitment and bravery. Uh, but their tactics are mostly ineffective. Um, mostly they're choosing targets simply because they're accessible and vulnerable. vulnerable. They can get to them, they can damage them. And obviously, like Starbucks windows are match that criteria, but don't uh, really matter for recoverability or criticality to the system. Um, so we're hoping to help future activists to be more effective. So this is a fun example from the military. So suppose a group decided that they wanted to shut down one of those massive coal drag lines because they want to stop coal extraction and uh, where they are. So they might, or actually, okay, suppose they want to shut down coal extraction in a spot and they identify the drag line as a crucial piece of equipment to shut down. And then they identify the electricity supply to that drag line as uh, a bottleneck that they want to hit. Uh, so then the military conveniently provides analysis of different pieces of the electric grid or the bulk electric power supply. And transformers, which we saw in the Operation Circuit Breaker site and were what uh, the Metcalf substation saboteurs targeted, they by far score the highest. And that's because of their criticality and low recuperability to the system and because it's relatively easy to get to them and hurt them. Like people are able to shoot them with hunting rifles from a few hundred yards away. Okay, so what comes after? Uh, I showed initially what our culture has done to the, to the land and the hope is that once the assault of fossil fuel enabled uh, industrial activity, uh, 
is stopped and once climate change is eventually stabilizes at whatever level it will that the land can recover back to some measure of health approaching what it used to have uh, and as far as just humans go to ask who will benefit again the worst consequences of all this industrial activity fall on the poorest people in the poorest countries and so immediately there are more than a billion people who don't even use electricity in their homes and they will almost certainly benefit right away from all this pressure being taken off of them. They're the people whose land and resources are still being stolen. Uh, people in poverty worldwide, uh, the indigenous people who still live or want to live off of the land but can't because of industrial culture. Um, currently there are 45.8 million slaves in the world and this isn't like debt slaves, people who are under a crushing load to debt. This is people who have a gun to their head or the threat of a gun to the head of their family back in their originating country who have to work or else they or someone they love gets killed. And the highest number of slaves are in India, China, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Uzbekistan. And you might recognize some of those countries from the labels on your clothes. Um, Uzbekistan accounts for 10% of global cotton exports. Um, so we all benefit, most of us benefit from that slavery going on and they will be much better off without the industrial system enabling global capitalism, keeping them in slavery. And of course, all future generations, everyone who wants to have a livable planet in the future, and even current people, uh, crash is gonna come one way or another. We all know that fossil fuels are finite. There's no way to continue business as usual. Things will collapse, uh, but right now, 227,000 more humans are being added to the global population every day. And obviously we're decreasing the carrying capacity of the earth with all of our assaults on it. So we're basically just increasing our overshoot and making the eventual inevitable transition that much more painful. So after fossil fuels are stopped, uh, we'll actually be able to have true sustainability instead of the version that's been sold to us by corporations. Right now in the US and many communities, true sustainability is fully illegal. Um, societies are homogenous with very little ability to self-govern. So without the boot on our necks that's allowed by fossil fuels, we can start to have local democracy, local food systems, uh, education of children in ways that really matter. And uh, there are plenty of skills, like the knowledge to live sustainably is out there. Um, obviously people lived here in the US and all over the world, indigenous people live sustainably for thousands of years and we can learn from what they did and also apply maybe some internationally shared knowledge to come up with some new solutions. But there's already enough info out there to, to live sustainably and live well. So what you can do, quite simply, we just need people stopping fossil fuels. And this is where living simply can transform from being just an individual act of purity and dead end, it can transform into being effective. Uh, by living simply, you can free up time and money to, to put towards stopping fossil fuels. And so the most important thing we need is frontline activists, and that's whether they're above ground, people carrying out blockades and occupations like we're familiar with, and especially people carrying out the underground actions because there's a lot more possibility for effective tactics there. Uh, one thing that's really critical, and I'll come back to this again because it's worth emphasizing, is that there has to be a firewall between the above ground and the underground. So me being here saying very publicly that we need people sabotaging the infrastructure makes me a very obvious target. Both if any actions were to happen in Hawaii, I would be one of the first people the feds come uh, talking to. And also I am pro more likely to be under surveillance. So not only can I not carry out any underground actions, but I also can't be in contact with people carrying out underground actions because 
my surveillance would then put them under suspicion. There may actually be a greater risk for those of us like me speaking out publicly because if and when shit really starts to go down, uh, we're obvious targets, even if we're not doing anything technically illegal, um, we'll still be obvious targets for repression by governments and by corporations and their private security and, and just by average Americans who are pissed off that this stuff is happening and I'm encouraging it. Um, that said, uh, so underground activists, if they're carefully thinking through actions and following proper security procedures, there's a much lower likelihood of them being caught and consequences applied. But if they are caught, then the uh, repercussions are likely to be much more severe because they are clearly breaking major laws. Uh, so a big piece of this firewall is that for anyone who is considering that they might eventually take underground action, do not expose yourself by acting the above ground. Don't join radical groups like this. Don't speak publicly about your support for eco-sabotage. Um, just keep a low profile if you might go underground. So the second piece we need, like not definitely not everybody can be on the front lines for lots of valid, understandable reasons, but the people on the front lines need our loyalty and our material support. So the people doing above ground blockades need people donating money, uh, sleeping bags, food, uh, transportation to get them there, maybe places for them to stay, etc. Um, it's more difficult to provide material support for people underground because they aren't very public about what they're doing. But if you're in a position where you know someone, then that's definitely a fantastic thing you can do to support them uh, with safe houses, supplies, food, shelter. Um, something all of us can do is reverse the TSA motto and see something, say nothing. So if you see something suspicious, keep it to yourself. Uh, a final thing we can do that uh, we're hoping to launch at some point is a prisoner of war support pledge. Um, basically, people who are willing to be above ground saying that if someone is charged for committing or planning to carry out underground actions of the kind we've discussed, then we'll donate money to their legal funds and help out in whatever ways. So that's a way to give people confidence, both that there are a lot of people in the community who support the actions they might take and so that can help just psychologically and also help them to know that there's some safety net there if they do get caught. And finally the the third important piece that people can do is underground promotion. What I'm doing right now uh, which is basically anything that helps create the conditions for an underground to develop and work effectively. Um, so that can be one-on-one -on -one conversations of just critiquing the failures of the environmental movement, however explicitly. Um, can be defending the actions of people like Jessica and Ruby and just saying how great it is that they committed eco-sabotage against a pipeline. Um, all the way up to, to what I'm doing of explicitly advocating that more people go out there and do it. and they're, definitely some security lines. So if you do this, you want to be pretty clear about what you can and can't say in your jurisdiction. Um, so just be, do more research before you jump into that. So again, with the firewall, um, so the above ground mostly uses legal tactics, works openly and publicly, and tries to maximize attention and actions because a big part of what they're trying to do is just get more public awareness on these problems whereas the underground is using illegal tactics, is keeping a low profile, and if they communicate to the outside world at all, it's with an anonymous communique. Then the other, so that's the fundamental piece of security cultures that people underground should not be associated in any way with those of us above ground. Then the second piece is keeping information on a need to know basis. Don't talk about, ask about, or speculate about, uh, your involvement with underground groups or illegal activity or other people's involvement um, or their desire to get involved. Um, yeah, just only talk to people who really need to know about 
illegal or potentially illegal activity or intentions. Only talk to those people. Obviously, never talk to cops about any of this. Um, even what you what you think might be harmless information, don't go there. They're they're well trained and skilled at using those wedges to to pry out the information they want. So shut down immediately when they start asking you anything. Uh, so I and Michael are members of Stop Fossil Fuels, which is a relatively new organization. We're just getting off the ground, but we have a pretty good website up in place, which covers a lot of the same material I did tonight and also goes into more depth in it. So definitely check out that website if you're at all interested. We have an email sheet that Dana might have showed to some of you and that's available. Um, so as our group moves ahead and gets more active, we'll use the email list to keep people up to date with what we're doing. Um, I, so this is an example where only people who know they want to be in the above ground should sign up on the sheet. If you might possibly ever go underground, you don't expose yourself in that way. And then another major source of resources, again, provided by conveniently by militaries around the world, uh, are all these guerrilla warfare manuals, special forces manuals, and so on. They're public domain. You can download most of them, get them from libraries, whatever. And the last thing I want to mention is that in the course, so I mentioned early on that half an acre of natural forest is cut uh, every, every two seconds, was it? Mm -hmm. I think so, yeah. So in the course of this presentation, three and a half square miles of natural forest have been cut globally. And that's roughly the size of the entire mesa. So if you can imagine all of that was cut just while we're sitting here, that's a way to visualize the other, otherwise uh, unimaginable scale of destruction. The end. <laughs>